there's a room tucked away in the corner of a house in South Florida where the man who owns the house actually doesn't go too often. But every once in a while, when he finds himself inside, he remembers. Some of the stuff gets stuck away in storage, and you know, you finally pull out an album and, you know, jogs the memory of, oh my gosh. I mean, this is really cool. And a pitch to bench, change hit in the air to deep right. When you're a baseball player, time puts a limit at how long you can play the game. But it can also give you that gift of remembering. Actually, I mean, I look back and say, did I really do this stuff? And I guess I did. And all these years later, from one of the truly greatest ever to play the game, there'll always be a lot to look back upon, to marvel at, to get lost in, all over again. Nobody really thought that a kid from a town of 661 people would be drafted or anybody would find him. There's a high drive to deep right center. That one is gone in the upper deck. Because while to some, memories might make you feel old, isn't there just as much of an argument that they also keep you forever young? Look at this. This is like September 1st. I, call, I got called up on the 28th. The Reds are dead set on producing the best bench in the National League. Well, pretty cool to be in Major Leagues 19 years old. You don't, have, you don't have too many catchers, even today in baseball, that come to the big leagues and are potential MVP candidates every year. Right on the I can't imagine a guy played that position any better than Johnny Bench. It's hard to imagine. Defensively, he was great. Nobody can run on him. He was a different animal when it comes to being a catcher in the big leagues. Johnny Bench was simply the best catcher I had ever watched. Milton settled over here with Jonathan. He's smart. It wasn't that he was good, because he was really good. He was just smarter than the rest of them. Collisions at home plate, concussions. I have six broken bones in each foot. That's a wear and tear position, man. Come on, get over here, right here, John, right here, right here. That's a boy. Line drive, left field, off the wall. Bench goes to second. He's turned a triple into a double. Nice going, Johnny. Cover, two. Johnny had a lot of ham in him too. I mean, he enjoyed that. When you hot, you hot. He's just always been comfortable in being himself. There's a lot of guys like him at Cats that were just born to be in front of people. He's going to be telling a joke, or he's going to be singing a song. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner. People love being in the presence and in Johnny's company. Well, I tell you, I heard so many times this year, when you're hot, you're hot. He was bigger than life. He was a Paul Bunyan myth. Can I get some Gillette Platinum Plus injector blades for my brother? Sure, John. Thanks. I mean, Johnny Bench would wind up on the cover of Time Magazine. I mean, he was that famous. He's the greatest catcher ever. And I've been saying it for my whole damn life. The Carolina League, I told the Papil, Colonel Papil, he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be the best player ever in the history of baseball. Cocky? Yeah. Inner confidence? Inner conceit? Yes. Wow. I did it. All these years after his last game in the major leagues, the memories of what once was aren't really what keep Johnny Bench feeling young. Because while he might be in his 70s, the man who many say is the greatest catcher of all time is something else now, too. A single dad of two young boys. Hey, guys. Time to get up. What? Time to get up. <sighs> Time to go.
Thank you very much. Joshua. Hey, bud. What color are you wearing? White, green, red? My choice? Help me out here. Justin and Josh are three years apart, and they've been living with their dad since 2017. My breakfast is almost ready. So four or five minutes, all right? It's not where Johnny Bench expected to be at this point in his life, but he wears his latest role quite naturally. Justin gets an omelet or cereal, depending on him. He gets, uh, he gets English muffin. Josh goes anywhere between waffles, yogurt, and uh, cereal. Josh is the kid just won't eat. You know, he's got, I said, I'll give you $50 if you hit a hamburger. No. I said, Josh, you're going to start eating something. I mean, you need to try a salad. He said, I don't like salads. I said, how would you know you've never had one? He said, I'm psychic, Dad. Yes, sir. Oh. I'm going to have it and wash it. Here you go. I get up, 550, 625, get them up. Josh! Come on. Omelet, cereal, whatever they need. And it's it's just great. And it keeps me young. That's your all-star game hat. Good. Joshua! Thank you. I can't even imagine being without those boys. Even for the periods that they visit their mom, it's, it's wow. You know, what are they doing? How are they doing? Get your... Uh, you get your vitamins, Josh? Mm -hmm. Okay. They're really my life. I'm Mr. Mom. I'm Dad. We eat, and then they brush their teeth, and now they're hair combing. Why do we have to comb our hair? Because you're a bench and you have to look good. And besides that, the girls are crazy about you, and they, no, I don't want to my soul. Tell me the girls are going to go crazy no. today. Yeah, I'm serious. They see this hairstyle? No, no. That's always what you say. No, no. Well, I keep hoping. No, you know. no, no. Yeah. I don't. The guy hasn't brushed it yet. I thought you were brushing. No. You're the artiste. Thank you so much for asking. <laughs> Do you have a problem with flossing? No, I'm because the only other I'm better than you are. We have a lot of fun, and then, OK, get your shoes on. Grab your backpacks in the car. I'm Dad. You ready? I am if you are. Well, I am. That's why I asked. Drop them off at 740. Come back here, make the beds, do the laundry, go grocery shopping. Anybody coming? And then you got to figure out what dinner's going to be that night. This is what we do. Binger, Oklahoma, a farm town with a population of less than a thousand. Not the kind of place that jumps off any map, unless you happen to know about the sports legend who was born and raised here. Now, Johnny did put us on the map. I remember one time a guy asked him, said, John, just exactly where is Binger? And Johnny, in his infinite wisdom, said, well, it's about 50 yards on the other side of resume speed. So that's about how big Binger is. Yeah, city limit signs are back to back on the same post. <laughs> Binger might have been tiny, but it didn't stop Ted Bench from encouraging his son, Johnny, to dream big. My dad had served in the war. Unfortunately for him, he served two hitches and never got the opportunity to play in the major leagues. He wanted to be a catcher. And we would watch the game of the week. Now batting the next superstar, the switch heading center fielder from Oklahoma, Mickey Mantle. And I, I looked at my dad and I said, you can be from Oklahoma and be in the major leagues? I said, that's what I want to be. And he said, well, catching was the quickest way to the major leagues and what the major leagues needed. So my life was consumed with baseball during baseball season. And when basketball season, I played basketball. We didn't have football. We started school on the 1st of August and at the 
end of August, we let out for three weeks and went out and pulled cotton and combined peanuts and I mowed yards and had the paper route and it was just part of, you know, a way of life. I learned how to work. I learned what work was all about. I learned not, not to be afraid of it. I mean, I didn't come from means or anything else. You know, I'm just a kid who grew up in Oklahoma. I met Johnny a long time ago. He always brings up Oki, Oki, Oki. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. He takes a lot of pride in being from Oklahoma and being from a small town. It's our 1965 Binger High School Annual. Our class consisted of what, 20? This is Johnny. This is Sharon and Johnny. Our teachers always had us write at the beginning, I think of every year, what we planned to do when we grew up. And he was, from the beginning, he was a major league baseball player. We were like, oh yeah, right, mm -hmm. yeah. right. So in eighth grade, I was only five foot two, the same size hands, same size head, same size feet. I mean, I was the uh, you know ugly duckling. I mean, the only people scouting me at that time was Barnum and Bailey. He was all hands and all feet when he was little. That's what we always talked about. Here I was, and I grew nine inches the next year, two years. and. And the junior year, they asked again, and I said, I want to be a Major League Baseball player, and they didn't laugh so much. He set that goal, and he was, you know, really a, a goal setter, I think, and, and worked toward that. I mean, when Johnny was here in Binger playing ball, he was exceptional, of course, but we'd had other ball players in this town that looked as good as Johnny was, but he had that desire that little something inside. I heard him say one time that uh, he was always uh, afraid to fail, and he wasn't gonna let that happen. He never, ever doubted for a minute that he would not be a Major League Baseball player. I remember riding my bike, and I'd be riding down the street, and cars would be whizzing by me, and I, I even thought, I said, wonder if they know that I'm gonna be in the Major League someday. Johnny clearly knew what he wanted, but in the spring of his senior year of high school, there was no way he could have seen what was coming. Our senior year, we are coming back from a baseball game, and we would have stopped at the top of the Binger High School team. We would have stopped at the top of the hill to let Spud off, but he was six, and we went down the hill. And all of a sudden, the coach who's driving the bus hollers, no brakes, no brakes. And we said April Fool. It was April 1st and everybody started laughing at first. And I was sitting about three or four seats behind the coach and I looked up there and saw him pumping the brakes and trying to change gears to slow it down. And I hollered, he means it. He couldn't gear it down. He tried to make the curve and the front fender hit it. We flipped over, rolled down the embankment. Johnny, I was sitting with him and he grabbed a hold of me and, uh, and uh, pulled me down on the floorboard. We were both holding on. Kind of went end over end once, and they right. say rolled about two to three times. And when it finally came up, it landed back on its wheels, the little door that's at the back of all buses. Johnny's legs were just starting to go out that. He still had me around the waist. Billy and Harold Dean were uh, both had died in the crash. Those two boys got thrown out, and the bus rolled over them. You know, I became a little bit, you know, hardened by it, I think. You know, it was something that could have happened to me. Here I was now, and here I am in a car wreck, and you know, I'm still with plans of who I should be and what I was going to be. And then the draft came along in 1965, the first free agent draft. Nobody even knew what the draft was going to be like. In fact, the Reds knew nothing about me. Some people in a bar were talking one night and asked the minor league coordinator what he thought about this kid bench. And he said, oh, we're not that high on him. And then he walked out of the door and said, who are they talking about? Who's the bench? And they saw me play two games, and loved the way I threw. And they drafted me in the second round. And I never thought for a minute that I wouldn't be drafted. I never thought that this would never play out. And here I was, uh, I guess, on my way. In the spring of 1965, the world began discovering what everyone in Binger, Oklahoma, had known from the start. Johnny Bench could play baseball, 
and the excitement only grew during minor league stops in Florida, the Carolinas, and Buffalo, New York. We hear about him during the minor leagues when he was coming up. Here could be the future superstar of the National League. Hey, the Reds got this stud. He was ballyhooed as can't miss, can't miss, can't miss. He's young, can hit. Betts does have power. A great behind the plate. He has this great arm. We heard about the arm. We really heard a lot about the arm. The finest arm of any catcher I have ever seen. You don't hear many stories about a catcher that's got a gun. It, it got to Cincinnati before John did. And he got there quickly. In August of 1967, Bench got the call. He was just 19 years old, and the Reds were making him their starting catcher. Look at this. This is like September 1st. I, call, I got called up on the 28th. Well, Johnny Bench, 19-year-old, called a good game Wednesday as the Pappas and Ted Abernathy combined to beat the Phillies. Oh, nice, Milt. He can catch. Kid really called a good game. When he got there in 67, uh, he was great so quick. Benches 12 big league games and press teammates and opponents. <laughs> Johnny was like a little general. You know, he, he was young, but he wanted to stay sharp. You're getting tired and you're rushing yourself now. And some of the veteran players, they say, shut up, kid. You know, something like that. Take your time, you stay on top, that's all. I remember coming to the big league scared to death. You know, <laughs> you know, it was like being a freshman in high school. He was a senior. He walked in ready to graduate. Rookie bench hero as Reds win 3-1. to one. Get high and hit deep. Bench followed up the intentional walk, bringing a drive to the wall. Over 400 feet away. I knew Bench was strong, but I didn't know he was that strong. The first time I remember seeing Johnny Bench, he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Check that out. Johnny Hands Bench. <laughs> he was recognized as the next Roy Campanella, Yogi Berra, uh, maybe better then. After his call up in late 67, Bench was the preseason favorite to be named Rookie of the Year in 68. But he wouldn't just win the award. He was so good that he began redefining what a catcher could be. Golden Glove play behind the plate with the opportunity to hit 40 home runs. Not many catchers, uh, could, well, none of them could do what he did. Everything he did seemed different. Johnny made one-hand catching the thing. You know, most guys that came up in the 50s, 60s, are, there were two-handed catchers. I broke my thumb twice, 1966. Then I broke it again at the end of 1967. And I said, this is stupid. That's when I started to become a one-handed catcher. I keep my throwing hand away from the flight of the ball and where foul tips might be able to hit it. He was a different animal when it comes to being a catcher in the big leagues. It all came so fast. But even with the instant success, it still felt like Johnny Bench was just getting started. You could see it coming. It was something that you, you felt, you saw, and you knew that this guy was gonna get better and better and better. You know, a lot of guys wanna play, whatever the sport is. Bench didn't wanna play. He wanted to win. There's a difference. And when the Reds hired Sparky Anderson as their manager in 1970, Bench got his wish. John, Larry is going to, uh... And let me tell you something. I'm not calling you out. I'm not second guessing you. What do you want? Sparky came out of nowhere. Nobody knew who Sparky was. You know, Sparky had, he had to prove himself. Can't do anything about it. No, I'm done. That's what I want to know. I said that's fine. Sparky's strategy was simple: ride his star catcher as far as he could. Well, goddamn, Sparky had to kiss his ass every once in a while for how good he was. There were times when Sparky, I said, you know, Sparky, come on. Am I ever going to get a day off? And he said, I mean, he'd always crook up that finger. Let me tell you, if we're behind him, we'll catch you to catch up. If we're tied, we'll catch you to get ahead. If we're ahead, we'll catch you to stay ahead. I said, I'm not getting any days off, am I? He said, no. The Reds were the powerhouse of the NL in 1970. We were 70 and 30 after 100 games. And they got the nickname to match. We were so good in 70, we became the Big Red Machine. The Big Red Machine. Big Red Machine. That Big Red Machine, which has been rattling and rumbling along. And Johnny was the key part. He was magnificent. 
this could be my best year ever. Who knows? Well, I'm quite pleased with the way things have gone, and especially when you're in first place. I had four ways to have a good game. I had to call a great game. Johnny was very intelligent. Ain't nobody sitting in that dugout telling Johnny Bench what to call. I could throw runners out. It would have been interesting to be a Reds pitcher, because you better get your ass out of the way. Like a block on plate. Forget it. We know that that guy is going to be out. And I could get hits. I remember facing him across the field, and he hit a rocket against that scoreboard. I thought he was going to knock it down, because there was continual noises after it hit. The Reds won the National League pennant in 1970, and Bench led the majors with 45 home runs and 148 RBIs, an easy pick as the league's most valuable player. He was 22 years old, not even five years out of high school in Oklahoma, and he was one of the biggest sports stars in America. 1970, I'm MVP. My classmate in uh, Binger, she calls and says, well, you know it is our five-year class reunion. And she said, we'd also like to have a parade and honor you. So, wow. And they got the trailers, and they got them in there. Congratulations, Johnny MVP. And here they are. We're all lined up. Didn't have a band, but we, you know, band in, in Binger. So here we go uptown, and nobody's there. Everybody is in the parade, except for three drunks who came out of Mike's bar, and they say, you're the man, Johnny. And, and we made a U-turn at the police station, and we waved at each other as we went back by, as we passed by each other. And that was our parade. Hi, I'm Johnny Bench. Of course I love to play baseball. That's why I chose the profession. Baseball is a great career. As Johnny Bench got set for his fifth full season in the big leagues, he was one of the faces of baseball a star who blended brilliance with dependability. Once again, it's Johnny Bench. In talking about Johnny Bench, he posted every day he went to the clubhouse. He posted his name, I am ready to play. That was what Johnny Bench stood for. He was one of those guys you could count on for four at-bats a day. He didn't like to rest. He was Paul Bunyan. I, I kept looking around for the blue ox. <laughs> The rock ribbed figure of Johnny Bench. His hands are bigger than his mitt. Somebody told me that he can hold seven baseballs like that. Johnny will stop because if you're going to score the run, he will stop you. You're actually blocking the plate from the runner coming in, trying to score. And when uh, you get those big, strong guys that weigh 220 to 230, they come barreling around third base. And sometimes you have second thoughts. You have to be able to prevent that runner from reaching home base because it means a game to you. And that's what you're trying to do is win. Well, what else is there but smart and tough? Those are the two most important ingredients in life. And he had them. Bench's toughness made him seem almost indestructible which made what came late in the 1972 season so stunning. This was in August. We went in for our team physical. They got the x-rays and stuff. And a few days later, they came back and said, we need to take another x-ray. And they said, we'd like to take what they call a graph x-ray. And I said, wait a minute, what is, what's going on here? And they said, well, I can't say unless the doctor. I said, well, I'm not going back in unless you tell me. He said, well, if we, we see a little shadow or spot on the lung, and we want to make sure. So they did the other graph, and, and then Sure enough, I had a spot on my lung. More tests on the spot on his right lung followed, but the doctors couldn't make a diagnosis. So now they don't know what to do, except they've got to go in there because I know it's about this size, the size of a silver dollar, and it's on the interlobe of the right lung, and they've got to go get it. I mean, you hear something like that, that's scary. You don't know what it is. I mean, is this a pimple or is this stage four cancer? You don't know. Still, everything they could learn, including the fact that the spot had only newly formed, left the doctors comfortable putting off the surgery until December. So despite the uncertainty, Bench kept playing, and playing as well as ever. If you didn't know, you wouldn't have known. I'm gonna say he, he took it in stride, but he didn't, he didn't complain. He just kept playing, and uh, th that was the way he was. Johnny was going about his business. So I don't know exactly what he knew, and none of us knew really anything more than he might have a problem here. But there was uh, nothing to indicate that there was anything out of the ordinary going on at that time. Bench's performance on the field never wavered, 
and the 24-year-old earned his fifth straight gold glove and second MVP award while leading the Reds back to the playoffs. A tremendous drive by Johnny Bench. But all the questions about his health were never far from his mind. I, of course, sort of went into that playoffs knowing that there was a chance that that could be my last game. Today, it's the fifth and final game of the National League playoffs at Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati, Ohio, between the Pittsburgh Pirates and Cincinnati Reds. The Pirates were leading by a run in the bottom of the ninth when they brought in their star reliever, Dave Justy, with the first man he faced wondering if this would be the final at-bat of his life. Well, Johnny Bench will lead things off for Cincinnati, their final hopes for 1972. Nobody really knows about the surgery except my parents and the ball club. And so I'm in the on-deck circle to lead off the top of the ninth, and everybody's yelling, Johnny, Johnny. And then they said, it's your mother. And I turn around and I look and she, she's looking at me and she's going, hit me a home run. I'm smiling to myself because this is Dave Justy pitching. I mean, it, you just didn't really hit Dave Justy. Justy took Bench down to his final strike and then number five dug in for the most dramatic moment of his young career. Well, we're either gonna start celebrating again in Pittsburgh very shortly, or all kinds of stuff that's gonna break loose here in Cincinnati in this ballpark. Trailing 3-2, bottom of the ninth inning, the only thing I could think about basically was, okay, maybe not this year. And then Johnny comes up. The line. And a bench to bench. Chains in the air to deep right field. Back goes Clemente to the wall. I hit like uh, 83 octaves higher than I've ever hit in my life. And the bench, he's through. The place is going crazy. Of course it is. You know, I'm going crazy. Johnny Bench who hits almost every home run to left field. Hits one to right. The game is tied. I don't know that there was ever a louder echo in that stadium. Bench's opposite field blast fulfilled his mother's wish and tied the game for Cincinnati. Everybody standing. Everybody. It's deafening in here. And five batters later, the winning run would come home in more unlikely fashion. And the 1-1 one -one pitch to that great. In the dirt, it's a wild pitch. Here comes Foster. The Reds win the pitch. It was stunning. It was stunning. All of a sudden, he crosses the plate and said, we're going home. <laughs> and it was so abrupt and so final. We're going home. We're going home. So the Reds win it four to three. Riverfront Stadium has gone absolutely berserk. I think to this day, you can almost still hear the echoes in that stadium. The come from behind victory against the Pirates would prove to be the high point for the Reds' 72 season, as they'd fall to the Oakland A's in seven games in the World Series. Oakland has won the 1972 World Series. But for Bench, the loss was quickly overshadowed by what he was facing next. Six weeks after the season's last out, he finally went into the hospital for the surgery on his lung. Four days after I turned 25, I'm having the surgery. And I don't know if I'm ever going to play again. By now, the procedure was public knowledge. And everybody waited anxiously for the results. Cincinnati watched with interest the personal side of Johnny Bench. He was hospitalized when a spot was found on his right lung. I mean, it was frightening. Is Johnny going to die? The operation lasted two hours, with the doctors removing a marble-sized lesion from the lung. You know, they cut the bone, they cut the rib, you know, they cut the tissue, they cut the nerves. The test results came back with good news. The lesion was harmless. The spot was found to be benign, but there was a tremendous outpouring of well wishes from bench fans all across the country. An airtight seal with these staples, they're still there, and stapled me back up across the chest, but I never was Johnny Bench again. But at least I got to play. And uh, I'll always thank Doc for giving me that opportunity. Do the players ever talk in the clubhouse at what age they think that a ball player peaks? Well, I think uh, around 26, 7, 8, 9 even. Those years are when you really fully matured and you've really got everything going for you. Johnny Bench was still just 25 when he came to spring training in 1973 after the successful surgery on his lung. 
looking forward to entering what he saw as the prime of his career. His team, meanwhile, also looked to be as strong, if not stronger, than ever. I was rookie year in 63. Perez got there in 65. Davey got there in 69. Johnny got there in 68. So slowly but surely, the Big Red Machine was developing. We were so good in 70, we became the Big Red Machine. But then Joe comes over in the trade after 71. And all of a sudden, the Big Red Machine was in full force. That was a team with a lot of alpha dogs. You had Pete, you have Tony Perez, you had Johnny. Joe Morgan gets traded there in 72. I give most of the credit to Sparky Anderson. He knew who the leaders of the team were. I sat over here with Jonathan. He's smart. When Sparky came to the Reds in 70, he gained Johnny, Tony, and my respect. We just loved him. And if he got our respect, the rest of the guys were going to follow suit. We had that first clubhouse meeting at the end of spring training. Sparky said, we're just going to set down the rules. Pete, Joe, Tony, Johnny, you don't have any rules. The other 21 of you, you're going to, and I'm thinking, oh, did I hear that right? Oh, man, now I don't have to sneak in through the kitchen if I'm out a little late and everything else doing this. This is the greatest. And then I'm like, oh, this guy's really good. Sparky Anderson, he has treated us like men. And I have to say, he's probably the finest manager in baseball today. Sparky Anderson say, hey, you guys in charge. Pete Rose, Joe Morgan, Johnny Bates, and myself. These guys over there, they're going to follow you guys. We have black leadership. We have white leadership. We have Spanish leadership. Oh, help me. No team's ever had a black Hall of Famer, a white Hall of Famer, and a Latino Hall of Famer, and a Hall of Fame manager on the same team in the history of baseball. Boy, it would be tough to field that team that we had because even the guys that aren't Hall of Famers are really good players. I mean, Concepcion's a really good player. Griffey's a really good player. Foster hit 52 home runs. Geronimo was a gold glover every year. So we had the same eight guys that played every day. That group of regulars would become known as the Great Eight, the heart of the big red machine in the 70s. When you walk in, to the big red machine locker room. Take a choice. Do you go to this Hall of Famer, or that person with the most hits in the game? Or do you go to this Hall of Famer over here, or how about this guy that belongs in the Hall of Fame? You know, you had your choice. Not only were they great players, but they had terrific personalities. Come on, Joe, here we And that team put a tremendous emphasis on winning. It was fun going to the ballpark back then. We had fun, but you know why we had fun? Because we won. We didn't win every year, but we never went to spring training. and we, we didn't think we could win. They were united in their goal on the field, even if their two biggest stars were hardly cut from the same cloth. You know, to me, you're two different people, and I think the public ought to know it. Actually, you call me an animal. Well, I call you the animal, that's right. right. We live kind of different lives. Johnny was always hanging with the right people. You'd probably say, I was hanging with the wrong people because I'm a gambler, OK? You know, I, I like to go to the racetrack. I don't think Johnny ever been to a racetrack. And the differences between Bench and Rose led some to wonder about their relationship. There was, especially with Pete and Johnny, competition. I mean, here was Pete, who had been there longer, had been a Cincinnati kid. He's playing in his hometown had developed the role of Charlie Hustle. And here comes Johnny, even though he's from Binger, Oklahoma, but had an air of sophistication about him. So who was the alpha dog between those two? Johnny was really popular in Cincinnati, but I probably was more popular simply because the only reason, because I was born there, not because I was a better player. I mean, I was born three miles from the ballpark. I don't know if Johnny really understood this ever. And I don't think he ever let that known, but I think he had trouble with that. There was no difference with Pete and I. We were partners in a car dealership. We were partners in a bowling alley. We had the same drive. He was driven to be that, and that was fine. Pete could be the spokesperson that was great, because I didn't have to talk. They'd come and ask an opinion, and he could give it. He was great copy. I didn't need the pub. 
And it wasn't like I ever looked at it like, what the heck is it doing? How come they don't come and see me? I don't care. When we're on the ballpark, we all get along. I never see a discussion or anything on between Pete and Johnny. They both understood they were in a situation where this was extraordinary. This may be one of the great teams of all time, and they weren't going to let any problem that they may have or who's going to be the biggest stud or whatever, and nothing was ever done to the detriment of the team. In the early 1970s, Johnny Bench was the most popular star on one of the most popular teams in America's most popular sport, and his fame extended well beyond the baseball diamond. Whenever you're around him, then sooner or later, he's going to be the centerpiece, and he's going to be telling a story, or he's going to be singing a song, or he's going to be telling a joke. Why is it easier to steal second base than it is to steal third base? Well, sure, that's simple. There's a shortstop between second and third. <laughs> Johnny had a lot of ham in him, too. Short. I mean, he enjoyed that. Oh. He had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> People love being in the presence and in Johnny's company. In 1970, I win the MVP and Bob Hope calls and said he wanted me to go on his USO trip around the world to Vietnam. And here I am now going around the world with Bob Hope and the Dingaling Sisters and the Gold Diggers. And we go rehearse in Burbank. And I do the shows, we finish. And then it became just a natural thing. I was on Johnny Carson, I was on all these talk shows. You weren't afraid to sing, you weren't afraid to do anything. When he's got a camera or a microphone in front of him, he's real relaxed. You know, there's something to that. You got to be cool, you know, when the camera goes. <laughs> hey, guys, how you doing? He enjoyed how the business of show business worked and uh, wanted to learn about it and became a part of it. And along with the talk shows, tours, and movie cameos came something else, his own TV show. In 1971, I had the uh, Johnny Bench show. My first guest was Bob Hope and Willie Mays and my co-host was a guy named Al Michaels. Oh, wow. I can see why Mike sent you over here. Gee, that is heavy. Very, I love you. We wound up doing the Johnny Bench Show, the syndicated variety show. So I was Ed McMahon to Johnny Carson. That was pretty cool. We had a lot of fun doing that show. I got to get my own work, Johnny. My TV show. Most of the artists we could get in those days were artists from Nashville, singers and everything else. Sing freely. Would you do that for us? Good. Even at that young age, he had that welcoming warmness to him, and I think that made people feel very, very comfortable with him. And that's why I think he developed as many friends, people who were well-known and famous. And while the friendship seemed to span every corner of Hollywood and the music world, there were also bonds formed with big names from other sports, none more significant, perhaps, than the king of golf, Arnold Palmer. I got to play golf with Arnold, and we walked the fairways together. And he would say hello to people. Hi, how you doing over there? Look at that one over there. Oh, how you doing over there? And, every... and you know, he knew how to made people feel good, made eye contact. And I think I learned a lot that day about what it was to be famous, but at the same time, let people in on what you are and who you are. If Arnie could teach Johnny a course on charm, maybe those lessons could be used on visits with another mentor. He talked to my players a lot over the years, and he, he would always have something to say that the kids loved. It would be something like this. Boys, I can't tell you uh, how happy I am to be here and how happy I'm going to be to coach today because it gives you guys a rest. I mean, he would come up with stuff, and the kids loved that because he was needling me. This is Johnny Bench. You know your autograph can be pretty valuable if you put it in the right place. Like I think Johnny Bench people. had a way of relating to the American public. People gravitated toward him because he was such a great athlete, and this guy was the real deal. Can I get some Gillette Platinum Plus injector blades for my brother? Sure, John. Thanks. At your local store. This is Krylon spray paint. Advertisers believed I had a clean enough image, and I was trustworthy, so I was always doing commercials. I've always liked the convenience of electrics. 
but none of them I tried got close enough. For a guy that didn't go to college, Johnny Smart knew how to sell a product. When a guy wears a mask to work every day, he kind of likes to look the best he can. He's a major star. And Johnny Bench would wind up on the cover of Time magazine. He was that famous and that popular. There's a lot of guys like him, cats that were just born to be in front of people. He's just always been comfortable in being himself. I've had him sing a few things to me on the bus, and uh, it always makes me grin. <laughs> when you hot, you hot. And when you not, you not. Put all your money in and let's roll them again. So, yeah, when you hot, you hot. And then there were other benefits of being hot. I mean, Johnny was the number one bachelor in Cincinnati. Pete was married. Morgan was married. Perez was married. So he was the bachelor in southern Ohio and northern Kentucky and eastern Indiana and just about every, every other place I could think of. Life was good for Johnny Bench. But back on the baseball field, there was still one thing missing for his powerhouse team. The Big Red Machine still had not won a championship to cap their story. There was a feeling around the clubhouse, in the buses, on the road, and that that was something special. And it was something that told me that we were on the precipice of watching one of the greatest teams in the history of baseball. The Sparky there have been some uh, tremendous Cincinnati teams in the past few years, and the sports writers are calling this team the best of them all. How do you feel about that? Well, I think it's our best club on paper, Chuck. It's just going to depend how we perform out on the field. The Big Red Machine entered 1975 as the class of the National League as usual, but defeats in the World Series in 1970 and 72 had been followed by a stunning playoff loss to an underdog Mets club in 1973 and a second place finish in 74. For all of their talent, the team still had not won a World Series title. It was hard for us because uh, we, we think we can win uh, all, all the time. But in 75, we put everything together again and we got the, one of the greatest thing ever. The Reds would win 108 games in 1975, the most by any National League team in six decades, and still unsurpassed all these years later. For his part, Bench led the club with 28 home runs and 110 RBIs. The Reds then swept the Pirates in the NLCS. The Reds win the National League Championship. To set up a meeting with the Boston Red Sox in the World Series, where it felt like all the pressure was on Cincinnati to finally get it done. If we'd have lost that one, we lose the Orioles, we lose to the A's, and now we're going to lose again, and we are the big red machine? Come on. The series would turn out to be one of the most memorable of all time. And you had exciting games. Every, every game was exciting. The Reds took a 3-2 to two series lead into game six in Boston, which set up one of the most famed endings to a postseason game ever. Bottom of the 12th inning. And it'll be Fisk, Lynn, and Petroselli against Pat Darcy, who has been very impressive in two innings. Pat Darcy pitches great, got ball movement, everything. 12th inning, he goes out to warm up. <laughs> and he barely gets it to me. I mean, he is barely getting it to me. And we didn't have any pitchers left. And Fisk will lead it off, has a single and has walked twice. He's been on base three times. I turned and looked in the dugout. And I looked at Sparky, I went, no chance. It was the drama of it all. Red Sox win it seven to six in 12 innings. And Carl Fisk had a lot of little boy in him right there, Joe. And Boston won that series three games to four from what I hear. The Sparky says, big red machine my ass. And I said, Sparky, relax, man, we got him right where we won him. Did you see that celebration they just had? They won't be able to come back to the ballpark the next day. But the Red Sox didn't just make it to Fenway. 
they grabbed an early lead in Game 7. Still, the Big Red Machine remained unfazed. He's down 3 nothing in the sixth. I say, hey, the game's not over yet. Wait a minute. And when he came to the plate in the sixth, Tony Perez cut the lead to one run with one swing. Perez slammed it over the screen, and now we have another one-run ball game. And knowing the Big Red Machine like I did, we knew we were going to come back from a 3-2 to two deficit. A Pete Rose single in the seventh would tie it, and Joe Morgan would then put the Reds ahead in the ninth. Joe Morgan's bloop single right now is the difference. The Red Sox are down to their last out. The Reds are one out away from winning the world championship. With a high fly ball, it should be all over. Geronimo's under, and Cincinnati has won the world championship, beating the Boston Red Sox four to three. Greatest moment, 1975, walking in the clubhouse. It meant so much to be validated for who we really were. Oh, is this too much? Oh. 25 players are world champions. The coaches, the trainers, the equipment men, the manager. Everybody's a world champion. Number one. We said we'd go to bed, and we did it. And there's no way you can't share all of that. I mean, that's the way you share with everybody. <laughs> the machine works only when all the parts are working, and it sure works and it's smooth tonight. And then I knew exactly what it was all about. It was pretty special. Oh, man. Oh, man. 1975 might have offered the perfect ending for the Cincinnati Reds, but the following year, they picked up right where they'd left off, with the Big Red Machine dominating the National League again, leading the league in nearly every team offensive category. For Johnny Bench, though, while he was still just 28, it felt like all those years behind the plate were catching up to him. I couldn't sleep on my shoulder. Every time I'd start to curl, to you know, load the bat. It just, somebody like stuck a knife in my shoulder. Didn't have a very good year. But we still had Tony, we still had Pete, we still had Joe, we had George Foster, Cesar, Kenny, Davey. I mean, all of it could carry anybody, me in particular, because they carried me. Would I have liked to have been better? I couldn't be. And when you don't have it, I mean, you're still good, better than some, but you're not as good as you used to be. Not as good as I once was, but I was good once as I ever was, and that was the World Series. Against the Yankees, his idol Mickey Mantle's old team, Bench's bat suddenly came alive. Certainly Johnny was a great clutch player. He had an off season, but well, when the chips were on the line, he came and had his greatest moment at the biggest moment during the World Series. He'd hit over 500 in the series with two home runs in game four. Got boy. Boys, I got news for you. We're going to be world champions again, Sugar Bear. I got news for you. We are now going to be world champions again. Hey. Doggy, doggy, old baby now. Hey, John. John. Gary. That's a boy. Hey, you big can too. Oh, boy. We're world champs, man. His hot streak earned him World Series MVP honors as the Reds dominated the Yanks over their four-game sweep. Play with these guys, and they've done the job all year. And then you're able to do something just to, you know, make up for everything you haven't done all year. With back-to-back -back championships, the Big Red Machine had now put itself in the conversation as one of the greatest teams of all time. The number one lineup that ran on the field will always be the Big Red Machine. There was something about the moniker. There was something about the way they just plowed through teams and ran over people. One of the greatest teams in the history of baseball. There's no disputing that. Look at the players. Look at those players. We had speed. We had defense, golden lovers. We had batting champions. We had home run champions. We had RBI champions. You come to a Big Red Machine game, you saw everything every night. We were a fan's dream. Of the world, Cincinnati is number one. 
I'll put my guys up against anybody. It'd be hard to match that team. We're happy to be back here as world champions. We hope you love us because we love you because you are what makes the Cincinnati the baseball capital of the world. Thank you. I watched you guys win last year. You took it very much in stride. You took it in stride this year. You're gonna take the third one in stride too? If we can keep together, we will. That's the only problem that, in my mind. Baseball has changed the free agencies and the opportunity to be traded or to go wherever you need to go. And, and when things like that happen, they can break up a ball club. Bench had it right. In the years after 1976, the big red machine gradually broke apart. And by the end of the decade, only an aging Johnny Bench remained. Rose is gone, Morgan's gone, Perez is gone. You're still here. Why is that? I guess I was the youngest. I had to figure at one time or the other, uh, I'm at the age where I'm, it's my turn to be gone. All the wear and tear of catching had forced him to move to the infield as a first and third baseman. And by 1983, at the age of 35, it became clear to him that his days as a player were dwindling. My performance has not been great the last couple of years, and I know it wasn't as good as everybody else wanted me to because my standards are very high. I lost it, and I, you know, I'm not afraid to say that. You know, most guys aren't smart enough when it's time to quit, but he wasn't one of them. And so in June of 1983, Bench announced that his 17th season as a member of the Cincinnati Reds would be his last. I decided about three weeks ago that it wasn't as much fun, and uh, the body says it wasn't as much fun. I couldn't catch anymore. My back was killing me. I have five bad discs in my back. And I couldn't play like Johnny Bench, and I wasn't earning the money. It wasn't fair for me to take it if I wasn't earning it the way I should be on the field that year. That September, as the final games of Bench's career wound down, the Reds honored him with his own night, giving fans a final chance to come to Riverfront Stadium and say goodbye. Presenting the catcher of the Cincinnati Reds, one of the greatest players ever to wear a Reds uniform, number five, Johnny Bench. But everything else was about the ball club about the team. I mean, 55,000 people showed up, and this was about me. It wasn't about a team, it wasn't about anything, this was about Johnny. And that's what really validated what my career was like. I did the right thing, I played the right way. And, you know, and people appreciated it. You have done everything with such dignity. A man who has redefined a position. He was the guy the city could be so proud of during that period of time, and fr frankly, forever. I mean, people just exult when they think about it. You have made this day complete. You have made it better than I could have ever written a script for. I thank you so much. My family thanks you. And I'm going to try like hell to play good for you tonight. Thank you. And in the third inning on Johnny Bench Night, the catcher improbably found a way to deliver on his promise, giving one more lasting memory to the Cincinnati fans. And now number five will step to the plate and they come to their feet again. There it is, he's the left, Cruz going back, and it's gone! Oh my, a home run for Ben Scott, his night, look at John! Number 389, and this crowd capacity is going crazy. Boy, to be able to say in your lifetime that you were a Reds fan and got to follow a Johnny Bench on a day-by-day -day basis. Hey, you are a most fortunate baseball fan. I gave them the moments they needed to be happy. Hell, I, was, I had a great career. Two-time world champion, two-time MVP, 14-time All-Star, 10-time Gold Glove winner. Johnny Bench had come a long way from Bengar, Oklahoma. He's the best ever. 
Oklahoma takes a lot of pride in the fact that Johnny Bench is an Okie. He's just one of us. Even to this day, he's one of the Binger guys. Yeah. Always was and always will be. We have a uh, class reunion every five years, and I think he's come to every one of them. If we go places and someone says, where are you from? And we say, Binger, oh, from uh, Johnny Bench Town? I was like, yeah, I graduated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it wasn't just the folks from back home who saw him as one of the game's greatest ever. Hey, I'm not the only guy in the world who's going to say he's the greatest catcher ever. He's the best catcher I've ever seen. There's no question about that. You can ask anybody on our team who to think uh, who was the best, the best catcher, we say Johnny. He not only did it better than anybody has probably ever done it, but he did it longer. No one ever said catching was easy, even though John made it look easy. It's the hardest position there is in sports. I played through these injuries. I played through all these things. I worked my butt off to be who I was. Bench has become the standard by which catchers are measured. I think Johnny was a better all-around player than most every player that you would could, could compare him to, and that would include me. If someone compares me to Johnny Bench, I'm honored. Uh, not only is the guy my friend, uh, I admire the way he went about his business. Five years after Bench retired, in 1989, he got a phone call. Hello? John. Yes. Congratulations, John. Jack Lang. Yes, sir. Just been elected to the Hall of Fame. All right. With the third, All right. with the third highest vote in the history of the election. Third highest vote? Third highest vote. It's official? It's official. All right. All right. All right. It was an honor he'd long dreamed about. But a few months after that call, news came about his old teammate. And there are new reports this morning about baseball's investigation of manager Pete Rose. Those allegations reportedly involve Rose's gambling habits. Uh, I don't know if I ever told anybody this or not, but Johnny is the one guy in the world that should be pissed off that I got suspended. And I'll tell you why. In 1989, from day one, the press followed me everywhere I went. Rose left the ballpark with a police escort refusing any further comment. And be honest with you, I apologize to him, but he didn't get his just due going into the Hall of Fame. And I think that in that respect, he got pissed at me. I've harbored bad feelings in, in a certain way because of the, what he did to the induction year that I had to endure. The more I knew, the farther away we got. You know, when you started hearing the rumors about what was happening and what was going on, then, you know, it's like, you know, keep your arm distance. And I understand why he did what he did, why he thought what he did, because that was his year. And that's why people think that we have ill feelings about each other. I love Johnny Bench. Johnny Bench is like a brother to me. By the time induction weekend came around that summer, the spotlight was back on Bench, who himself was happy to share the experience with the man who'd first taught him the game. The best part of it all was I wasn't going into the Hall of Fame. My dad was. We go to the, the hotel, the Oda Saga. We get out and the limousine. I tell mom and dad, I'm going to unpack. I'll see you downstairs later. So I take the take the luggage, I go and I unpack, and I come out of the room, and I'm walking down the hall. Here's Enos Slaughter. Hey, I just met your dad. And I get to the elevator, and the door opens, and I'll step Pee Wee Reese. Hello, Johnny, I just met your dad. And I get down to the lobby, and I get out, and here's Ted Williams. Hey, I just met your dad. And so when I made my introductions of the family, I said, I would introduce my dad, but I'm sure most of you have met him already. That's your cue, Dad. I would hardly be surprised if you all out there haven't met him yet. He has ta taken this town by storm. To think that you can go back to Binger, Oklahoma as a four-year-old kid and learn baseball from the man who hit the longest home run ever, who was the best baseball player ever, my father. I feel very honored to stand before all of you today and accept this plaque and go into the Hall of Fame with the greatest people on earth. To see 
that picture with him and the tear in his eye. That's it. I mean, I gave him everything. You know, I gave him everything he could hope for. A guy by the name of Yogi Berra said, it's not over till it's over. Yogi, it's over. We have made it. And thank you very much. This is New York City. Hello. John. Yes. Congratulations, John. Just been elected to the Hall of Fame. All right. What the all right. <laughs> you said all right before you even finished the sentence. Well, he said Hall of Fame. Justin, the only reason why you can tell that you weren't born is because he has hair on Yeah, he saw his hair on his head. It was the foul balls that took all my hair off. <laughs> <laughs> 30 years after he got that phone call, life is different for Johnny Bench. Arguably the greatest catcher who ever lived, now just goes by dad. All those memories, though, are still there. And there still are plenty of ways to share them with his sons. Bobby Bench is from Johnny's second marriage, while Justin and Josh are from his fourth, which ended in 2017. You know, my brothers, we visit Cincinnati every now and then, and, and when I took them to the Reds Hall of Fame Museum, they got to see the World Series trophies, which are as big as they are, and they turn around and there's a statue of Dad. And they get a kind of realization of, oh, you know, we don't just come to Cincinnati and go to these parties for nothing. There's, there's a reason Dad did something special. You don't throw this, I'm just telling you right now. See ya. Whoa. You ran a bit slow Did there. Back there. You run slow on the home runs. You know how that is. You had a few yourself. In the back of my mind, I know they know stuff. Josh had a report, you know, he had an essay he had to write. So he picked me. I was MVP in the World Series and I won the Gold Glove. He wore the uniform to the thing, but we're writing out the essay. You start saying, I did this or I did that, and I'm doing it with him, you know, it's all of a sudden, you know, it was pretty cool. Come on, get over here, right here, John, right oh, here. Oh, look, now you're look not jogging. Run. Look at the speed. Can you tell me again who him is? That's me. Look at Johnny Rowe. Who's what do I Johnny? say, Johnny? I always say Dad. Who's Johnny? Johnny Rowe. Your hero. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Do I make a better dad because I was in the Hall of Fame? I'm in the Hall of Fame. I don't think that does anything. Hey, do you know who I am? You know, I, you know, it's, yeah, your dad. That's the greatest answer in the world. You know, I look at Johnny now and the way he's raising the two young boys, it's pretty amazing. I mean, uh, not too many fathers could could pull that off. But the one thing about Johnny that I can see that translated from baseball into what he's doing right now is uh, he's going to immerse himself in something. Yeah, right. And he has in this particular situation. I mean, he's playing that role of, of Mr. Mom, which is not something I ever would have thought, you know, 45 years ago would be happening right now. There's nothing that fulfills my life the way these boys do. It's the love that they show me that is the greatest reward of all. Thanks, Dad, for a hug. Here's a guy with a big heart. He answers the phone. For me, it takes time. Hey, 44, this is five. Tell me what's going on. Uh, and the conversation is about health. It's about relationship, friendship. To just have that tie that we became friends, and then I look back and, and I'm like, wow, I tried to be number five. Little Liggers fought over the Jersey Five, and we all tried to play catcher, and how many childhood memories I had of Everything was Johnny Bench when we were little. The friendships still endure, some inscribed indelibly into the fabric of his life. What did it mean to you that he named his first son after you? Well, I think when he did that, the first thing I probably had was tears. Oh, as I look back in my life, I never had a more enjoyable experience with people than I did with Bench. Not a lot of people get to live a life the way Johnny Bench has. And to hear him now, 
you get the sense he knows that. People love to come up and they say, you know, I was a Dodger fan, I was a Philly fan. But man, I really respected you. I really respected your team. And then they named the team. See what that throw is? <laughs> Out of here. Thank you very much. But alongside all those memories, it feels like there's a whole nother life still ahead. And Johnny Bench is ready for anything and everything it's going to throw at him. It was a magnificent time, and I'm just, it's now even more so, I think, because the gratification of being able to meet the needs of those boys. It's something that I strive to do and want to do, and I, I relish the fact that I have this opportunity.